Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, class um, on uh, cliches, faith beyond cliches. Uh, Esther was very interested in this. And, uh, that's why she uh, was, yeah, she, she'll just keep coming up here to the front. Um, I chose this topic. One thing is that there's a lot of cliches um, out in the world. And uh, a lot of times we, we hear them, or we say them, or we encounter them in some means, um, and we just accept that that's, uh, you know, we're going to hear those things, but maybe we should actually think about them a little bit um, uh, more deeply. And uh, I also chose it for us the summertime because you, they, they can kind of stand alone. So you, you, can, you can come to whichever session you get, if you're away, you can, you can, uh, you can still jump right into um, being a part of this uh, series, and it's a, I'm going to say about 30, you know, the, the conversation continues going maybe 40 minutes of time, so just a, a little bit of time on our Sunday mornings during the summer um, to kind of explore this, and I will talk, and I'm going to have some quotations and, and look at some scripture and those kinds of things, but I'm expecting that I'm going to hear some, I'm going to ask questions, and I'm going to get something from you all in response, um, because you have experience in the world, and that, that experience is valuable to this entire group of people as we learn together. Um, so this is, it's an opportunity to have a conversation about what these things mean. So my first question for all of you is, what is a cliche? What is it? I, I actually have the definition, but I'm going to see if anybody can come up with a, you know, a, a definition from your experience. So uh, think about what a cliche is. Something that you say is true without ever thinking about it. Something you say is true without really ever thinking about it. A set of expression. A set expression. So it's you know, you know something that is said by lots of people. Um, so not just you know, you know make, making it more collective. Yes. Something that fills a conversation void if you don't know what else. Uh -huh, yes. It fills the void when you don't know what to say. Um, so in those kind of awkward moments, and you're like, uh, what is ha what's happening? So I, I think all of those, here is what the dictionary says. It says, a phrase that is overused and betrays a lack of original thought. Uh, so I, I, that is a definition from the dictionary um, about what a cliche is. And the, I think we got, as we, we were hearing people's uh, uh, offerings about what you know, a cliché is, or what the definition of a cliché is, we got a little bit about why they're used. Um, there are simple answers to, to, to in, in uncomfortable situations. Um, we use them, say, you know, when we're in a, we're in a line of people and we're trying to, to you know, make them feel good, we use them to kind of fill space rather than saying nothing because we feel awkward when we say nothing and so that's what that's why cliches are used and they avoid those kind of tough conversations because when you say it, it kind of shuts everything down um, you don't know how to respond to them if you know if you're the person receiving the words um, today's cliche is everything happens for a reason has everybody heard that said or have said it at some point in your life. I hear, I see a lot of nodding heads. We've heard it often enough. I'm not sure. I guess I must have said it at some point. But um, here's some other way. It, it must have been God's will. God needed a new angel. <laughs> These are all related <laughs> sayings to this. Everything has a reason. See, that's the religious phrase. Yeah, yeah. So that's I mean, it has different. I mean, it has a little different vibe, but it's 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 a, essentially the same yeah. thought or same idea. <laughs> so I've had uh, in my experience. I I, re, I remember saying this to. Uh, oh. Yes. And also sometimes people say those things to make themselves feel better or less awkward. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So it's, it makes you feel, it makes you feel good in the less the less awkward situations. Um, when I was a about ten years old, I used this cliche, and I used it when I it was a, a it was I was I said it to a priest that I was going through a line. His wife had died. He was retired. He was the first priest I really knew as a young person. And we went to the funeral, and uh, um, he he had retired from the church where we had we were attending. And we were walking through this line. I was with my mom and my dad, and we walked through the line. And I said, oh, well, everything happens for a reason. I said this as a 10-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> like I knew. <laughs> uh, I said, everything happens for a reason. And, and the priest that I said that to stopped me. And he said, hold on one second. He actually, I mean, I don't remember all of the words that he said, but he, 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 we were in this long receiving line, and he stopped and he said, hold on one second, I want to say something about that. And it really caught me by surprise, uh, but I still remember it too. Because often we say things, and we say these cliches, and it just swoops right over people, and they don't respond. And, they, and, and we do the same thing. We hear it and go, okay, and we move forward. I hope that as we hear and we think about cliches in our lives, that potentially we will make it an opportunity for a deeper conversation. Not, not, to, not to make somebody feel bad, but just to say, hold on one second, I, I, I want to talk about that. I want to open up some conversation about that. I want to have a tough conversation about what this means. Where do we get this saying, everything happens for a reason? There's a guy by the name of Calvin, not the one from the comic strip. Theologian, uh, who lived in the uh, first half of the 16th century. He was French, but he, was, he, he found his, his calling in Geneva, Switzerland. He was, he was in the reform movement. Um, if you are Cal I mean, Calvin, uh, his uh, theology is the beginnings of the Reformed Church. We have a Reformed Church here. Uh, the Presbyterians, um, the, uh, the Congregational Churches have at least yeah. beginnings in Calvin. That, that doesn't mean that they all believe exactly what Calvin said years ago, just as Episcopalians are always in motion. Um, but Calvin um, really had some ideas about sovereignty, about what God was saying, and what God meant, and what God could do, and what God's role in the world was. And so I'm going to give you a quick summary. And I will tell you that Calvin was prolific. There are libraries of Calvin's works. When I was a, when I was a, the, a theology student, we just, you know, there were just shelves, just crazy numbers of books and lots of words. Um, but what he um, said was, God is all-powerful and all-knowing, and that means that God has control over everything that happens if Christians don't believe that, then we doubt God's power. So that, I mean, that's a, that's a quick, I mean, many books summarized in two sentences. Um, the extension of that is that God is controlling everything, the weather, the births and the deaths, the choices that, all the choices that we make, everything um, that is, happens in the world, God is up there moving around on a board of some sort. Uh, I don't exactly know how you know, it's computerized or anything like that, but it's somehow it's connected in there, and God is maneuvering all those, those things around, and it, and it leads to this idea of predestination. So God created and, and knows the whole, the whole arc of your story before you've done anything. That is the whole idea of predestination. And uh, so that is, that's Calvin's beginning belief, and that that theology actually seeps into our culture in so many, I mean, it just happens. Um, he was prolific. These, these churches started up and were founded. People heard this theology and this understanding and these teachings, and then they, they would talk to their children about them, and they would pass on from generation to generation. And that's how things get into the way we think and how we are. That's, that's the way it is. And so Calvin is the beginning of this idea Although, I don't know if he actually said those words. I do believe he would have you know, said, you know, put a seal of approval on them if you were hearing that. 
So here's what happens when this is, uh, this, what, what happens to uh, this when you start thinking about it a little bit deeper and as you think about it in our context as Christians. Um, when I was a chaplain of a school, I would show up at a game and they'd say, oh, please do a prayer for our team to win this game. <laughs> I, found very, I found that very awkward. <laughs> what if they don't win the game? There's a lot, I mean, what, would that mean that my prayer wasn't working? What was, you know, what was the, what, you know, all of these, you know, I, was, I started thinking about this, you know, of course, this was with the, you know, teenagers, and, I'm, and, and they're like, oh, well, you need to pray for us that we, we're, we're going to win this game. Um, that God is somehow in control of those kinds of things, and that everything happens for a reason, and the reason is, is that you pray for us, not that I put in the effort to become a better basketball player, or a better volleyball player, or whatever the game was. It becomes about what kinds of things that we need to do to interact with God to make that happen. That's awkward. I worked really hard on prayers for games. <laughs> and I, uh, in my prayers, I talked a lot about how the, the work that we, you know, the, the, the practicing and, the, and, the, and the, all the things that, I would know all of the things that went into becoming a team that might lead to uh, you know, having good results and taking God, trying to take God out of the result of games. Because I don't believe that God is controlling who wins the World Series, for instance. Um, if God, if I could just say a prayer and make that happen, I could be, I'd be a billionaire. <laughs> and I'm not. Uh, it also, when you start thinking about that, it takes out human responsibility. If everything is being, if everything is been controlled by God, that means that the choices we make are the choices that God has already said that we're going to make. Everything happens for a reason. It says that we, you know, uh, you know, in some case, you know, when you in some context, that means that we didn't have any part in this in the in the running of this world. That we have no responsibility. That we have no choices. Also comes into things like when people, you know, people die in accidents. What was the reason for that? Why would God do that? And those are deeper and harder things to reflect on. Think about historical events. Why did the Holocaust happen? What is the reason for that? If everything has a if we go too far on everything has a reason, everything happens for a reason, we are powerless to change the things that are going on around us. We can't make a difference. And that means that we're, it's fatalism. Yeah, it's just the way it is. I'm just going to go it along and I'm not going to care about anything. And that work breaks down on love and how we interact and have relationships <clears throat> Sort of the, 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 the fundamental paradox, you know, if God is good and God loves us, and if God is all powerful, why do these? Why does God do this? Yeah. You know, it's sort of, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? Famous book, which is a cliche. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but 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 that's the paradox. Mm -hmm. You know, that it, that that if we believe in an omnipotent loving God. must happen for a reason, a reason we don't know. Why well, when you say, the 
it's usually something happened and you don't understand why. Right. And so, well, there must be some reason for that. Right? Okay. Yeah. So there's, yeah, so you don't understand, you, you, you're trying to find a reason yeah. and, and mm -hmm. humans gravitate toward reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, our brains are made up to, to you know, find patterns. And when we don't find the, when we can't find the pattern, then it's like, oh, we gotta say something. Yeah. I don't know. Um, maybe I'm looking at the other side of the coin, if you will. But if you first say that saying such a cliche would lead to inaction because God takes care of everything, could we not look at the other side of the coin and say this leads you to action? Because here's here's an unknown, and possibly had this situation not occurred, it may not have occurred to you to take some sort of action. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question either. Mm -hmm. It's like good things coming out, it's like good things coming out of bad. Exactly. You know? yeah. Yeah. Um, exactly. Especially in the in the in the, uh, the last few the last few years. I mean we've got vaccines, we've got uh, that we didn't wouldn't have had be, wouldn't have had before. Uh, We've got uh, people in people. We've got uh, which is, we've got new people in places where they weren't before. Yeah, I mean, uh, so what? What you, uh, you, I mean, what, 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 you're, what you're saying is, is that we have, uh, yeah. So bad things happen. You know, COVID is terrible. Um, I don't think anybody's going to say that it's great, um, but we've we've had to grow through it, and that, that as a result of that, there's I mean it's you know everything happens for a reason. That I mean it, it, you, you can say, oh well, all bad things will lead to us having to change our behaviors to adapt to something to make it better. I, you know, I wondered. I hear this all the time. suffering and evil is just not that but to imagine that God is not all powerful is actually more frightening mm -hmm. than um, you know sticking with the cliche um, or the hope is that you know regardless of if you die or metaphor Psychologically, get out of it, right, right. and so it's it is it is a it becomes a lifeline to that, right. which is some form of you know some form of surface that you can connect to, right. tether to. Yes. Uh, sometimes when you say let's, uh, if bad things are brought about by Satan, let's say, yeah. um, then you have to wonder why doesn't God step in and say stop. I won't allow that to happen. You know, because we believe in a gracious, merciful, good God. Yeah. Yeah. It's, there's this, another part to that which you just got into, which is not just why did God do this, but why did God let this happen? Right. Yeah. And that's, it's another take on the same thing, but it's not quite. So, yeah, so it's, you know, talking about where does it, 
evil is there, yeah. why does it, if God is all powerful, why does God not get rid of that? <laughs> why do you need to get rid of this particular evil? Yeah, or you know, it could go down to a specific, yeah. uh, you know, a specific person or a specific you know, movement or a, yeah. an idea. Why doesn't God get rid of that? Um, and that is, it's hard for us to fathom. It, it, theology's hard. Um, because we're trying to put our human brains around something that is beyond us to do. Um, it doesn't match the scientific method. Um, and so it, it, it makes it, it makes it <coughs> debate and there's reflection and, there's, and, it, and it's nuanced. And that makes it challenging. Yes, sir. You know, just thinking about what everybody's talking about, I'm just thinking. I'm, uh, I'm a kid. And in a weird, perverse way, I think God said, you can deal with this kidney disease because I'm going to hit you with something else that will test your resolve, which was getting cold. So it's like, all right, if you can deal with this, you definitely deal with the COVID, and you'll be stronger once you get through it. Still dealing with the kidney disease, but I don't know if the COVID came first, I would have dealt with it. A lot of people was not strong enough to fight for their lives with this COVID. With the kidney disease, I say that I have a family that loves me and a granddaughter that I'm just getting to know. I'm really fighting to stay around for that. I think that's, a, that's one of our future cliches. Yeah. That God doesn't give us anything we can't handle. Yeah. And, and, and just to add one more thing to it, I dealt with, I'm dealing with the kidney disease, I dealt with the COVID, and I'm still around now to help my mother who's in the throes of dementia. So, I don't know how to add it up, but everything has a reason. Everything, everything has, has a reason. reason. Yeah. Everything has a reason. Everything has a reason. <laughs> everything has a reason. Yeah. Everything has a reason. Yeah. That's how we can put our brain around the, the, yeah. the yeah. real chaos of this world. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think I really had to confront this when a very close friend who was like a sister to me got ALS. And, you know, that was a three year, very painful journey and I could accept that her time had come, but I mean, I, I, I still cannot accept why does anybody get ALS? It seems to me the very worst uh, uh, way to to die. And ultimately it was kind of like the Kierkegaardian leap of faith that to use another cliche, you know, um, <laughs> the Lord works in mysterious ways as one is performed to accept that I don't understand, I can't in this life, understand but just to trust God in, in that situation. Let me read some scripture. <clears throat> about choices and about humans being involved in choices. Uh, this is very early. Genesis chapter 1 it says, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And, it's, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. That is what, after humans have been created, that is the task that humans have been given. It is more we're setting you forth. I, I, I always imagine when I'm hearing that, I'm like you know, throwing, the, you know, the, you're throwing the bird up into the air to see you know, the mother bird throwing better fly, um, you better do something. Uh, but there's a, there's, it provides this choice. And that is continued in the next story in Genesis, in the Adam and Eve story. And it says the following. See, the humans have become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now they might reach out their hands and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent them forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which they were taken. He drove out the humans, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and the sword, flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. There's two 
things there. First of all, they know the difference between good and evil, so there is some choice involved in the things that we're doing. And the second piece is, is that we live a finite existence. We don't know how long that is. And it's, you know, that's, that's the way the world works. So how do we take advantage of what we've got? Here's a passage from Deuteronomy. And I'm going to read all these and then we could talk about it. This is from, uh, this is in the, after Moses has given the Ten Commandments and says this is what is happening. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him, for that means life to you and length of days. So this is after giving the commandments. Moses said, now you've got to choose. You want to go in the direction of life or the direction of death. There's obviously some choices and it is humans' responsibility to be involved in that. And the choose life and then chose is one of the phrases that the um, anti-abortion forces have used. It, it, it has been, and, and uh, certainly that, that is a very literal meaning of the word life, rather than saying, uh, you know, they're talking about the molecular study of life, um, rather than thinking about life as being the gift of that we that we possess, and how do we how do we choose to live in a way that is life giving, not only to us but to the wider world. Um, and then Luke chapter fifteen. Um, this is from the prodigal son. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. This is a continuation of that idea of life. He, had, he was lost and has been found. Life is choosing to be in relationship with people rather than talking about molecular science and when life begins on a cellular level. Kurt, if, if, if I may, what you read earlier <clears throat> about choices, is that sort of the theological origin of free will? It is. Okay. Uh, so so God created us, but also granted us free will. granted us some dominion <laughs> over the things of the earth. So we yeah. are the res we have responsibilities. Um, I mean that's how we get to the, the baptismal covenant, which talks about how we need to take care of uh, you know, take care of you know, make sure that the, the earth will still be around. because mm -hmm. um, we have we are the one being that has the ability to make those kinds of choices. No other being has that. And God is, you know, in creating humankind is saying, oh, this is the being that, sh that will be helping the other beings continue to live. Um, here is, um, from, this is just the idea of hope. Hope is an important concept. If you're talking about any theology, you've got to have hope. Um, and this is from 1 Corinthians. Uh, so Paul is talking to the Corinthians. What am I saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Look, I will tell you a mystery. We will not die, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. This is a passage that is read at Easter. every year when it falls in the lectionary it comes up it's read at Easter and it's about how all of the things that we do we death is not the it's not the final answer it's beyond that it's beyond what our ideas of life and death are and that is a, that is the hope of the Christian person 
is to live in that, that struggle, understanding that, oh, everything has a reason, and that, you know, if you're going to take it even, you know, take it further, is that reason is that we have hope in God. So we could be feeling this despair in a moment, but the thing is that we have to remember that all of it will be swallowed up and it will be gone. Questions, comments about these scripture passages? For sure. Right. I think my 14th century mystics who would be in Norwich when you read that where she says all shall be well and she was given a vision she didn't know how it was going to be well but her, the vision was that you know God came for love and love alone and all shall be well and you know all manner of things shall be well which is you know a mystic writing in the middle of a bubonic plague um, and grappling with death, destruction, sin, unbaptized babies which were and the Hundred Years War, and I'm thinking, yeah, you know, but you just don't know. But I think there's a difference between searching and uh, faithful curiosity, faithful searching, and not even asking the question. There's the all shall be well on the other side of prayer and active action and service, and the everything's going to be okay, everything happens for a reason, which is sort of just laziness and not grappling. I think there's Uh, at the expense of appearing heathen, I'm going to open this up a little bit wider. Uh, my understanding of, of God is not understanding because one cannot understand God. Uh, but God can be experienced as the loving, divine, consciousness that permeates creation and is the cause and sustenance of creation. And to my mind, one thing that helps in understanding all these questions about causality and how things work is to think of it as God is the divine consciousness which permeates and is the cause and enlightenment of the entire creation. Now, that said, God is not up there with a clipboard, <laughs> you know, running everything or keeping track of everything. God has agents to do that. That's the laws of nature, which, which we don't even begin to understand. How is a woman impregnated and a new life born? You know, how do these bodies even work? How does... How does any of it work, really? We don't know. I mean, some do. We know part of it. But in truth, we really don't know. Um, and to me, that's the great mystery and, and the beauty of the whole thing, is that if you look at it, and what I find helpful is just to look at it as God is the consciousness, which is beyond it all, yet the cause of it all. And in that sense, God does know everything that's been not a sparrow falls, you know. But at the same time, God isn't choosing the sparrows that fall. That's that's nature. You know, and certain traditions, the Hindu tradition in particular, has gods for these things. Now everyone thinks that Hinduism is is polytheistic. It's not. It's the ultimate monotheism. But they assign roles for these different functions in creation. And um, that helps me kind of understand. So, uh, you know, what I'm, I'm, I'm going to summarize. Okay. Um, so there's, the, the, there's creation. And that is the, be you know, the beginnings of, of all things. Um, and you can Putting your head around that is, is very challenging. Um, Impossible. We can't think back that far. We can't understand all of the complexities of that. Um, I, there's a, Esther has this book that 
I don't know how in the world they wrote this book, but it's a, it's a book called Quarks. Does anybody know what a quark is? It's it is. It is in physics, but there's a baby book for this. It's called Quarks, and Esther likes quarks. She says quarks. Let's read that book. And I had never heard of quark. Um, I took science classes, and I was, I don't know when they discovered them. I don't know anything. But you know, quarks connect. There's three quarks that connect and make a... Uh, Jennifer, are you there? But they're, you know, they, 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 you know, it makes them, you know, the quarks make into an atom, <coughs> and so you add in a neutron, neutron electron or something like that. And, and I'm reading this book to her, and I'm like, how do we know that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I, I'm reading the words, but I don't know if I necessarily understand it. And, uh, but it is, I mean, it's that, it is that, that's creation. And that's, uh, and then how does God you know, keep interacting with us? With the world, not just us, with the world, and that is this this what I'm going to I'm going to define as love, and this this the spirit that 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 intersects with all of us, and we can touch it, and we can be a part of it if we make choices to do that, mm -hmm. and that is what is going to that's the connective fiber that continues to be the spirit that connects us and is part of what we understand as God. Um, but our minds are still too small to understand it. And I think that's, that, that's the wrestling that we're doing as we're trying to come up in a conversation and when a, often when a tragedy has occurred or a, a trauma has occurred in somebody's life and we say things like everything happens for a reason, is that we don't understand all of that. We don't understand the connective nature of all of those pieces and we don't understand the spirit and we don't understand why good, bad things happen to good people. We don't understand all of that, so we, we just have to say something. And my contention as a person who's been doing this for a while is that we don't have to say anything. The chaplain. We don't have to say anything. And that's often a better response than saying something.
but I still not understand it. Right. But you will continue to grow through it. Mm -hmm. And so it's that, that we're in times that we experience in uncertain life. It's God's time. It's God's time. Right. And that is, I mean, the, the idea of time is, is, is really, it's, it's, we love to think in time because we exist in time. Um, and that's our, really our only experience. intersection with time is really Jesus and then all of the other you know that's that, that's a very short spurt of time there uh, when Jesus was on earth um, and then the resurrection occurred and that's and so that's that that was like a, a moment in time a moment in our time in which God was was um, uh, engaged um, but then God is so far beyond time that we can't quite get our yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's taken me to, you know, the age of uh, 73 to, to really understand this, that maybe my job is not to know, but just to pray. And that, that's ultimately how I confront difficult things. And I find, I mean, prayer is amazing. And, you know, that that is really the answer. And one of my favorite prayers is the, the prayer of the centurion, Lord, I do believe that help thou my, my unbelief that you know there can be a lack of acceptance of the tragedy and yet at the same time with the prayer and I, I have seen very difficult situations I remember once I was having some pastoral counseling from a rector and I was really in despair about my my brother who was not open to praying for himself and I said you know Tom does it help if I pray for him if he doesn't pray for himself and he said yes because your prayers open up channels where God's grace can flow, and that was like, I mean, that was absolutely true, and the story had a, as good a resolution as it could, and I really could almost probably feel God's grace flowing into those channels, so it's something that I remind myself of, uh, you know, in other situations today, but, you know, ultimately, I think prayer is the answer. Yeah, and, and prayer is, prayer is our opportunity to be open, to express our, our our, what's in our heart, but also to receive a uh, by opening up our heart to be able to receive God's call back. And uh, mm -hmm. it's not a it's not a voice like <coughs> our voices. It is mm -hmm. it is being aware of the world around us and being open to uh, God speaking to us through what what's happening in you know happening around us and being uh, that's the the channel that is existing by opening up ourselves. Sometimes the answer is no. A lot of times the answer is no. I mean, I'm sure there are people praying and, 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 and praying for all this stuff, and, and like the answer, that the Holy Spirit is in this stuff. Yeah. Like the answer is no. Thy, thy will be done. And it's, uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, when we, we're opening ourselves, prayer is not a channel to, it, it goes back to the idea of, of the, my sports prayers. <laughs> tell you that the teams that I was praying for didn't always win. <laughs> um, we were not undefeated, uh, and that is normal. And uh, and the, the God is not involved in those you know the yeses and nos. God is open to opening up our our bodies and our <coughs> spirits to something that, <coughs> that is happening around us, and so that we can better understand how we relate to these things. It's all about relationship. One of the things I See a book, obviously, the beginnings of a football game or near that, and the only thing you pray, pray for is a, is a safe, if it's a, a game where nobody gets seriously injured. Bumps and bruises go with the territory. Yeah, doesn't always happen that way. Yeah. <laughs> always happen that way. <laughs> but serious, no, serious head injuries, serious spinal injuries, that you want to, no, you, you can ask. That's the sense, to me, makes sense to ask God. To keep people safe. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's maybe you think that's that's. I, I mean, I would yeah. certainly pray for that. Um, that. I'm not guaranteeing that God is. You know, that I, I'm not saying that God is up there doing, making sure there's a, a halo yeah. around everybody and uh, mm -hmm. keeping them safe when they're they're taking risks by being in the game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, as Herschel would say, that's yeah. the laws of nature are. That's not necessarily being controlled, you know, by God's uh, puppet, you know, the puppeteering skills. Let me close with this idea: that, uh, a good, a good, 
start to our class and we will uh, continue with further cliches in the, in the upcoming weeks. But let me conclude with this um, quotation. This is from a, a pastor who's uh, no longer alive in um, his name is Ray Firestone. Suffering is not God's desire for us, but it occurs in the process of life. Suffering is not given to teach us something, but through it we may learn. Suffering is not given to punish us, but sometimes it is the consequence of our sin or poor judgment. Suffering does not occur because our faith is weak, but through it our faith may be strengthened. God does not depend on human suffering to achieve God's purposes, but sometimes through suffering God's purposes are achieved. Suffering can either destroy us, or it can add meaning.